All right, guys, welcome back to Revive School. Here we are in lesson 36. Why I get excited is, and honestly, even when I'm studying early in the morning or late at night, I get really excited because I was like, well, at least it's not the book of Job. And yet when I read the book of Psalms, I I'm not going to lie to you, like it's still an emotional roller coaster. You have a minimum of, do you guys remember how many authors we know at least of? Five or six? Seven. We know at least seven authors. Well, close enough, Kevin. Uh, you know, and, and David is like this. You know, he's like, oh, I love you, Lord. I hate you, Lord. You know, that's how it goes. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, God, you're the best God ever. And so it's like this constant up and down and up and down. And really what you're going to see in Psalm 18, it's, it's an up. <laughs> you're going to see an individual psalm of, of thanksgiving. And yet at the same time, it's going to have this royal characteristic. So, Kevin, when we talk about royal psalms, when we talk about royal characteristics, what can you expect in Psalm 18 if we say that? Uh, it's going to point to the Messiah. Absolutely. So what you're going to see is this language. And in fact, before Psalm 18 starts, which Kevin, you wouldn't have on your notes, but it, it's always called these, uh, you know, you have the titles or then you have these superscriptions or these scriptions kind of deal. This is actually, Rich, I don't know why I thought of you. This is actually the second longest superscription in the Psalms. Okay, so what that means is it's not just like, let me give you an example. In Psalm 11, it just says a title would be Refuge in the Lord. And then a superscription or subscription, subscription, it's not a magazine, or it would be for the choir director, David. So it's just kind of a title and then a subtitle, right? In Psalm 18, what you see, it's kind of crazy. It says a praise for deliverance. So there's a praise that God, a thanksgiving, you've, you, you've helped set me free. But then listen to this superscription. This is behind Psalm 60. So Psalm 60 has the, the longest one. Now, this isn't even considered. Now, here's a question for you. Is this considered scripture? I'm going no. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking that's just for us that like, you know, like, the, the, the people that got together and were really smart and said, hey, we're going to put this in the Bible. I think that was like, hey, uh, these people that are reading it, they're not going to be able to understand it. So we'll add a little bit more context for it. All right. So here's a little bit more of the context. OK, second longest in the book of Psalms for the choir director. OK, so this would mean, Kevin, when it says for the choir director, what would you expect? Uh, it'd be for the people that are going to they're going to sing it. Right. The guy who's going to lead it, because remember, the book of Psalms is that it's intended for us to Oh, so Rich, have we had Kevin sing to, yet? Not today. Kevin, by the end, may, maybe, maybe you can just sing, I love you, Lord, my strength. That would be a good one, right? Pretty basic. Okay, so here, listen to this. For the choir director of the servant of the Lord David, who spoke the words of this song to the Lord, on the day the Lord rescued him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, all right, isn't that crazy though? Like, here's a whole description. Like, you don't even have to do research on this. It's right here. Praise the Lord. So here's the deal. Choir director, I want you to understand these are the words that David actually articulated. So as you're singing, I want you to understand David is singing a song. You should be singing a song that David is talking about. Oh, I've been set free and my enemies aren't getting me, a.k.a. Saul. But interesting enough, you're going to see throughout this, this text, David really doesn't see Saul as his enemy. It's, it's a bigger picture. It's the enemies. And in fact, I want to just reference something that MacArthur says. You know, it talks about God's deliverance from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. But the reality is what you're going to see in Psalm 18, it's a summary of, of the testimony of David's life completely in res retrospect. Like, not only have you set me free from, from Saul, but God, look at all you've done in all my, all my life. So there's this language here that you're going to start seeing. And it's kind of a weird, it, made me, it kind of makes me uncomfortable. But I'm going to write it anyway. There, there's this image throughout the Psalms of a lesser David and a greater David. The, the lesser David is now, meaning David in that context. And the greater David is the future, a.k.a. the Messiah, a.k.a. the King of Glory. Does that make sense? And so this is what you're going to start seeing in this uh, this bigger picture. Now, Psalm 18 resembles, and Rich, you asked me earlier if we were going to go there. It resemble, resembles, Psalm 18 resembles 2 Samuel 22. Uh, it's going to almost feel identical, you guys. David spoke the words of this song 
to the Lord on the day the Lord rescued him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hands of Saul. Wait a minute. Does that not look like Kevin? Psalm 18, verse 1, but before that, the, the superscription? Yeah, it, it, so in some regards, it's almost identical. Verse 2 says, this is the, the, he said, the Lord is my rock, my, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my mountain, where I seek refuge. Okay, just, just stay there for a second, okay? So that's 2 Samuel 22, 2 and 3. Now, Kevin, if you go to Psalm 18, verse 1 and 2, just to give you an idea of the comparison. And we could do this literally all day. Compare Psalm 18 to 2 Samuel. I love you, Lord, my strength. Look at verse 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my mountain, where I seek refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So what, what, what are we talking about here, Kevin? Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22, David is talking about what? His deliverance from, from his enemies. His deliverance from his enemies, which God provides ultimately, yes, from Saul, but man, from a bigger picture. Okay, so what you're going to see is, I just want to say this, Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22 really is about the lesser David. It really is about David in that context of that scenario. It's like 2 Samuel 7 in, in, uh, in that context of like, uh, you remember David's going to have a son that's going to last forever. Well, that son is that the, the lesser David would be Solomon, right? That, that person here and now. But then the bigger picture is ultimately the greater David, which is going to be Jesus. So you're going to see this consistent pattern throughout the book of Psalms. And the reason I didn't like the language of lesser and greater is it's a weird picture, but yet it really is true. So, all right, let's just jump in if we can. Uh, that kind of gives you a backdrop of where we're at. Verse one of Psalm 18, and really the first 18 verses, okay, is what Wearsby says, and I really like this, God delivers when we call on him. If you're in a time of desperation, your enemies are surrounding you. In fact, later on this week, we're going to talk about the enemies surrounding us from all sides. Jeremiah talks about being surrounded from all sides. Why would you not call on the Lord in those situations? Is there any purpose, Kevin, of why a person would call on the Lord? If they don't know him, don't have any idea. Sometimes that's the only time we call on him, unfortunately. What, what are we ultimately saying? We got it. I got it. I'm good. I don't, I don't need you. I'm fine. But in Psalm 18, you see the opposite. You see David saying, man, I love you, Lord, my strength. He, he really is saying like, this is a cool picture. It's a rare verb. This word love is a rare verb, as MacArthur says, that expresses tender intimacy. You know, there's John 21, 15 through 17. You know, three times Peter has already walked away, right? He's already denied the Lord. Three times. Remember around the hot fire when Jesus is being crucified, he's, he's getting into this process of, of death and they're like, hey, do you know you? And in fact, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And I love Peter's words. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then he says, shepherd my sheep. And then here we go again a third time. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Why I like this image of John 21 and how it ties into Psalm 18, verse 1. This is going to sound like a weird question. Would God have to ask you if you really love him? Or does he already know? Yes, I know he already knows. I get that. I get that. God knows everything. But what I'm implying is, is that if there's this intimacy, you shouldn't have to ask. Now, I understand Jesus' picture here of Peter. He's trying to prove a point. Look, I I'm here to redeem you. I'm here to say, yes, we have a relationship. I know you've, you've burned a bridge a couple times. And I think that's what I want to say as well. I think some of us have burned our bridge in our minds with the Lord. And he says, no, you can always have this intimate love with me. You can always have this crying out for help. You never have to be like, like Peter and be like, yeah, I totally screwed up. I can never come to the Lord. How many times have we interacted with people out on the streets? And they say, there's no way I can come back to the Lord because of all of the things that I've done. I'm telling you, God always wants to deliver you and set you free. The question is, is do you want this intimate relationship? As it says in Psalm 18, verse 1, do you have this relationship that you, you love him? that there's this tender intimacy. When there's a tender intim intimacy, you wanna know why Psalms intimidated me, you guys? It still does, actually. Is I think the area, I know this is gonna sound weird, there's an area in my life that I need to work on in this part right here. Why? Because of verse two. 
See, when there's intimacy, you can actually call out God by different names. I don't think it's actually just knowing the word. Yes, I do think it's knowing the word, but I think there's something about knowing him. Like in my prayer life, you guys, I don't naturally just cry out to him as my fortress. I don't naturally just cry out to him as, as my deliverer. I don't cry out to him as my, as my rock. Yeah, I, my, my God, I do. My mountain where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. What I'm getting at is when you know your wife really well, you have nicknames for her. You have nicknames for him. Does that make sense? There's this love relationship. In the book of Psalms, to me, it really is, it's, it's an ongoing love relationship that the psalmist has with the Lord. And when I read this, I get intimidated, honestly, by the psalmist because he naturally just flows who he is in God. And sometimes this doesn't come natural for me. Sometimes I think when I pray, I'm like, God, what should I call you? Like, it's almost like a, there's just something that's in the way. I don't know. Does this make any sense to you guys? I mean, it's just like friends that are acquaintances or are they friends that you can pick up multiple years later and just go from where you left off? There's a radical trust that you just know him. And I, I think when God delivers us, when we call on him, my, my simple challenge in the book of Psalms, I know this sounds so simple, but I want to get there, you guys. I want to be able to call out to him like this. I want a prayer life that says, and I'm going to write these out. There's seven metaphors that the psalmist writes out. First one he says is, he's my rock. Kevin, walk through this with me, will you? My fortress. Fortress. Keeps on going. Then what's another one that he calls him? My deliverer. My deliverer. But this is what happens. He's calling out to my rock, my fortress, my, de my deliverer, Kevin. My mountain. My mountain. Just talking at metaphors here. My shield. Good. Horn of my salvation. Ooh. We'll get to that one here in a second. That's a pretty powerful one. And stronghold. My stronghold. Okay, but let's play a game. In your prayer life, in the last week, have you called God any of these things in your prayer time? Not any of the metaphors. Like, I'm not, I'm not here to make anybody feel bad, but I, I feel like, man, I can't believe I'm going to go here. I feel like it's like when you learn tongues. <laughs> Gosh, just don't turn off the dial, okay? And when, when, I f when people first start speaking tongues, this is not the case for everything. It's like, a, it's a language that like you have to grow into. It's just like speaking English. Okay, hang on here for a second. Don't, just, just relax. Like as a little kid, what do you have to do? You have to learn the language over and over. When you're speaking in tongues, for some people it just naturally flows. For some kids that are five years old, they could read everything better than me. But not, that's not usually the case. You have to learn the language, okay? And so I feel like for, for me in my prayer life, like you can go from just, just speaking utterances, almost like this, this initial tongue, but I want to get to the process where it just flows in the spirit. It doesn't matter if it's in tongues or in English, okay? Don't, don't take it like that. My point is, like I'm basic in my prayer life at times. Well, let's keep going. He says, look, I, I called to the Lord who's worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. And then what he begins to do is he begins to walk through like stages of his life as he's calling upon the Lord. So Kevin, you're right. So in verses four and five, really what, when I, what I like what MacArthur does is, is so we're going to integrate some, some MacArthur and Wearsby on this, is that he says in verse four, the ropes of death. Okay, were wrapped around me. The torrents of destruction terrified me. The ropes of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. So what do you see here is, first of all, he sees in, in calling out for deliverance, it's his desperation. Okay, but then what you're going to see in verses 6 through 15 is that you're going to see God as his defender. So he says, I called out to the Lord in my distress. I cried to my God for help from his temple. He heard my voice and my cry to him reached his, his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled. They shook because he burned with anger. And this is a really powerful picture. In fact, it's a poetic picture, as MacArthur says, of God's presence. It's a theophany. Ooh, Rich, it's very teacherish, isn't it? Yeah. Right? So look, just look at this language, okay? It just said in verse 8, smoke rose from his nostrils and consuming fire came from his mouth. Mouth, Coals were set ablaze by it. He parted the heavens and came down. A dark cloud 
beneath his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew soaring on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, dark storm clouds his canopy around him. From the radiance of his presence, his clouds swept onward with hail and blazing coals. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High projected his voice. He shot his arrows and scattered them. He hurled lightning bolts and routed them. That's a cool picture, isn't it? You, you know what that says, right? He's in control of the lightning. The depths of the sea became visible in verse 15. The foundations of the world are exposed at your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. So when you're calling out to the Lord, you view him honestly as, as your desperation, as your defender and his deliverance. It says he reached down from the heaven, and I like what MacArthur says, is here God's coming to the rescue. He reached down from heaven, he took hold of me, he pulled me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. In other words, I, I can't do this. I cannot get out of this situation. It's too big. And in verse 18, it says, they confronted me in the day of my distress, but the Lord was my support. And I love verse 19. He brought me out to a spacious place he rescued me because he delighted in me. You guys remember the book of Job? I feel like I want to go there for a second in this little painting. <laughs> Isn't this an awesome picture of Psalm 18 right here? Think about this. Ultimately, what is God doing? I mean, if you go back to verse 17, Kevin, Psalm 18, verse 17, it just says, in 17, it says, he rescued me from a powerful enemy. In fact, if you go to verse 16, it just talks about this. He took hold of me. He pulled me up out of out of deep waters. I promise you, if you don't integrate the Lord as your deliverer, you will drown in the deep waters. I'm gonna jump back to this word love for a second that we were talking about in Psalm 18, verse one. When you realize that you have, like it's a, it's a love that a mother has for her baby. So can you go to Isaiah 49, verse 15? I wanted you to get, I wanna get this image in your mind, okay? So a mother for her baby says, can a, can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? Even if these forget, yet I will not forget you. Like this is the kind of love, a love that a mother has for a baby. This is the intimacy that we want. Kevin, you go to Psalm 103, verse 13. What will you see? A father for his his children. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Like, the Lord drastically loves us that much. As a mother for her baby, as a father for, her, for, for his children. And then just one more, Kevin. Uh, if you'll go to uh, Psalm 102, verse 13. Yet arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show favor to her. The appointed time has come. You know what this is? It's, it's the Lord and his love for for Israel. As the mother has a love for her baby, a father has love for her children, and the Lord has a love for Israel. When we realize that love is, it's like this, oh man, you can call on, on the Lord at all times in desperation to defend us and to, to deliver us. Something that uh, Warren Wearsby said about Psalm 18 that I, it just really struck a chord to me. Is remember, this is about a Thanksgiving uh, psalm, right? This is a deliverance psalm. Again, Kevin, why is, he, why is he praising the Lord? Why is he giving thanks? Because he's been delivered from his enemies. He's been delivered from his enemies. Wearsby called this the National Day of Prayer and Praise for, uh, uh, for David. It's an interesting concept because remember, they're singing, right? And, and they're, they're praying. It's, it's a blend of worship and, and witness Psalm 18 truly becomes about a focus on the Lord, what he did for his servant, but at the same time, what he can do for us today when we trust in him. So Psalm 18, in some weird way, becomes a national day of prayer and praise. And could have been a psalm that they recited for years to come. Why? Because he had an intimate relationship with the Lord. Like you can go academic all you want. You can read this all you want, you guys. But when you're not talking to the Lord and you're not praying to the Lord as if you have a love relationship, it's just head knowledge. I want to wake up on my knees talking to one that I, that I love. And I'll be honest, 
even in revived school, it can become a routine. It can become, hey, I'm editing. Yeah, great, God, I get to push buttons and type in scripture verses. We can say that. Or you can say, God, what is it in Psalm 102, 13, this compassion for, for Israel? What, what are you saying to me in all of this? Like, it's a matter of love intimacy that we have with the Lord is based on how we do our things. Based on how we're a husband. If you love the Lord so drastically, you'll love your wife as he loved, uh, loved you. I think you get the point here. I am clearly confessing to you on the screen, listening on the radio, listening in audio, maybe you're listening in the car, like this is where I wanna go and I'm not there. You can say, well, why are you so hard on yourself? Because I wanna grow in my walk with the Lord. And Psalms is intimidating to me because I see something that I'm not. Honestly, it's easy to be a Gideon, I I'm serious. Like, yeah, I'm going to be radical. I'm going to walk by faith and I'm just going to go out there and say, God, you're in charge. Let's do this. But when it comes to like sitting quietly and, and praying and crying out the names of the Lord because I know him that well, like that's not me. And that's why I want to grow. Wearsby continues on breaking up Psalm 18 and he just says, OK, first of all, one through 18, God delivers when we call on him. But then this is kind of fun. God rewards when we obey. And you're going to see that in verses 19 through 27. Kevin, if we can, let's go to verse 28. At the same time, I want you to understand, this is a really cool picture. God equips when we submit to him. You're going to see that in verses 28 through 45. Wow. Think about this. Like, Kevin, you, you had even said over the course of time, like David had gone through so many experiences to get to this point of his prayer life to get to this point of prayer of thanksgiving, to get to this point of, of, of a psalmist writing my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my mountain, my shield, my horn of salvation, which is in reference even, you guys, into Hebrews 2.13, which we're not going to get to today, but, and then also my, my stronghold, because God equips us to grow in this. He delivers us, He rewards us, and He equips us, and all of it is, is when we're submitting to Him. Now, here's where I want to go, and I, I, because of time, Kevin, can you go to verse 43? Verse 43, I don't want to miss this. Remember, our language for the Psalms is that he is the king of glory, right? Psalm 18, verse 43 says, You have freed me from the feuds among the people. You've appointed me head of nations, a people that I had not known serve me. Now think about this. He delivers, right? He rewards and he equips. And then what does he do? He equips David, what? To be appointed over what, Kevin? What does it say? Over the nations. The head of the nations. You guys, remember that go back to the lesser and the, and the greater? The lesser, is, the lesser David says, okay, I, I've eventually I'm going to be in charge of, of nations. But the greater David, prophetically, it's speaking of the reign of, of the Messiah. Eventually, we know, that this is crazy, you guys, that the Messiah is going to be in charge of all of the nations. Specifically, here it is, the sheep <laughs> and the goat nations. So uh, Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. If you'll just go there, Kevin, briefly. Matthew 25, again, it's a prophetic picture of the greater David. The lesser David says, I'm going to be in charge. I've been appointed to be in charge of the head of the nations. Well, eventually, David is going to be appointed to Christ. Then he will also say to those on the left, depart, from, uh, Kevin, if you'll actually go to, uh, can you go to verse 31, please? Matthew 25, verse 31. Now watch this. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, remember the King of glory? Here's a cool picture already. And all the angels with him. So imagine the king of glory coming. We're going to get to that this week. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Verse 32. And all of the nations will be gathered before him. So Matthew 25 verse 32 is a picture of Psalm 18 verse 43. He will separate them from one another just as, he she as a shepherd separates the sheep from the ghosts. So what he's going to do is he's going to take the sheep nations and the goat nations. And it says this in verse 33. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, the sheep nations, come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What you'll find in the rest of Matthew 25 is that the sheep nations are those that are identified. You ready for this? That align with Israel. 
Just a cool picture of in Psalm 18, verse 43, David is, is saying that he's going to be appointed over the head of the nations. And then eventually the Messiah says in, in Matthew 25, yes, I am going to be in charge. And then in Revelation 7, Kevin, verse 9 and 10, you have this picture of Psalm 18, Matthew 25, Revelation 7, 9 and 10. Guess what? It says, after this, I looked. This is talking about the greater David, the king of glory. There was a vast multitude from every nation tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white with palm branches in their hands in verse 10, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What a sweet picture, you guys, of David calling upon the Lord for deliverance. God rewards him in this process. He equips him in this process. And all of this lesser David points to the greater David, which is going to happen through the Messiah. I'm just saying this because this, this is a really fun psalm. Uh, Wearsby just says this in closing. God is glorified. Remember this. When we worship him. You see that in verses 46 through 50. So through our deliverance, through the rewarding and the equipping, guess what? Ultimately, it all points to his glorification. It all points to God's glory when we worship him in this process. In verse 49, he says, Therefore, I will praise you, Yahweh, among the nations. I will sing about your name. And in fact, it says he gives great victories to his king. He shows loyalty to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. You have a praise, a thanksgiving, an incredible psalm of David saying, thank you for delivering me. But ultimately, you guys, what you see at the end of Psalm 18, it's a royal messianic affirmation, ultimately, of the Davidic covenant. What you ultimately see is all of this points to the Davidic covenant, which ultimately points to 2 Samuel 7, which we know ultimately points to the Messiah. Paul, even, you guys, in Romans 15, verse 9, if you'll go there, Kevin, I just, Romans 15, 9, I mean, he, he quotes this, you guys. He's quoting Psalm 18, and so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing psalms to your name. Here it is. You know, you see God among the Gentiles. Jesus is, is in this in this process. In Romans 15, it goes literally from uh, the Jews and Gentiles rejoicing together to then eventually Jesus is going to be reigning over the Messiah is going to be reigning over the Jews and the Gentiles uh, at the end. Okay, there's a lot to study there. There's a lot to process. But all of this points to the greater David. Kevin, any closing comments? I think it just shows the intimacy that David has and the trust he has in, in his God. And we can have the same thing. We can totally have the same thing. And my prayer is, is that uh, you'll even start today. All right, guys, bless you. And we will continue the study of the book of Psalms tomorrow. Thanks.